So Victor Hamburger was born in 1900 and very early on developed a keen interest in the natural world. Some of his scientific training included uh, training with Hans Spemann and Frank Lilly. And he had a very accomplished scientific career. We all have learned aspects of Dr. Ham Hamburger's work, from the role of programmed cell death in normal development, to the identification of nerve growth factor, and also, of course, the developmental staging of the chick embryo. He also was a very thoughtful teacher. And so, for example, he was the one responsible for converting the MBL embryology course to an experimentally based course. And I dare say that many people in this room and have taken that course, taught by others, and really inspired them to become developmental biologists. After his death in 2001, uh, the Victor Hamburger Outstanding Educator Prize was founded by the STB Board of Directors. This award recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to developmental biology education. These contributions are construed in the broadest context and can include teaching at any level, training of professionals, organizing and administering programs, integrating developmental biology into our education system, or disseminating reliable information to professional members, prospective developmental biologists, students in other fields, or to the general public. It's a great pleasure for me to present the 2017 Victor Hamburger Outstanding Educator Prize to Dr. Freeman Rubowski. Dr. Rubowski is the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, serving in that role since 1992. He grew up in Birmingham, Alabama during the peak time of the civil rights movement. And indeed, he was a child leader in the civil rights movement and was featured in Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls, that focused on the racially motivated bombing in 1963 of Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. He entered college precociously at the age of 15, graduating with highest honors in mathematics from the Hampton Institute before receiving his MA in mathematics and PhD in higher education administration statistics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's published extensively with an emphasis on minority participation and performance in STEM fields. His counsel has been sought by many. For example, he chaired a National Academies Committee that produced the report, Expanding Underrepresented Minority Participation, America's Science and Technology Talent at the Crossroads. He was also named by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Dr. Rabowski has received numerous awards, honors, and honorary degrees, far too many for me to list tonight. Some include being named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and one of America's best leaders by U.S. News and World Report. He's received the TIA Kreft Theodore M. Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence, the Carnegie Corporation Academic Leadership Award, and the Heinz Award for Contributions to Improving the Human Condition. He's a AAAS Fellow, elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. In 1988, he founded the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. This program is open to all high-achieving students committed to pursuing advanced degrees and research careers in STEM fields, and who are interested in the advancement of minorities in those fields. It is the creme de la creme of programs of its kind, serving as a national model. It's produced over 1,000 alumni, and nearly 300 students are enrolled in graduate and professional programs. Alumni have earned 231 PhDs, which include 45 MD PhDs, one DDS PhD, and one DMV PhD. Alumni have also earned 107 MDs and 247 master's degrees. These numbers are most impressive. Dr. Rabowski published two books describing the program, Beating the Odds in 1998 and Overcoming the Odds in 2001. For all of his work with the Meyerhoff Scholars Program and his entire body of work promoting education, we're delighted to present the Victor Hamburger Outstanding Educator Award to Dr. Freeman Grabowski. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Bill. I, it, it is interesting that the person taking the photos who works for STB is an undergrad from UMBC who went on and got a PhD at Ohio State. So give Marshall a round of applause. That's it. And then my colleague Michelle is here who has been one of my thought leaders in thinking about developmental biology, uh, Michelle Stars Gannon. Would you stand up, Michelle? I'm very proud of her. She's tenured faculty now at UMBC, and I'm very proud of her. Very, very proud of her. So let, let me start by saying that when I asked my colleagues, a number of whom are in, in developmental biology, uh, what they thought uh, I might say, uh, they said, first of all, that some of the things I said at the regional would be appropriate. But what was especially significant to me was that all of them, almost all of them, mentioned students of color in their labs, where they're going for grad school, from Berkeley to, uh, it was amazing, Hopkins, what SDB had done for them, because students had come here to your sessions uh, and had been given travel funds in some cases. And then today it was interesting to hear Michelle talking about two things. One, how she as a grad student took advantage of this. And then two, how you had the boot camp for faculty. That, and she was saying just how important uh, the soft skills are, that people sometimes don't realize how important it is to have that support even before beginning in a faculty position. And so I decided that I did not want to use slides. I wanted to talk with you for a few minutes about this critical question of inclusion of more people, of expanding participation. And I especially wanted to think for a moment about uh, the, the wonderful career of Professor Hamburger. Uh, we sometimes take for granted things we hear if we don't focus on them. And, and uh, I think it would be inappropriate not to take the time to recognize, as several of my colleagues said when they wrote back to me, that here was a man who knew, had to know discrimination himself, who ended up having to leave Germany to come to this country, and who was able to overcome all odds by becoming the very best. And interestingly enough, there is a quote that he used in 1988 that uh, was in an interview after he had published his piece on the heritage of experimental embryology uh, and talking about his mentor. And he said this, if I am very lucky, it, talking about this piece that he had published, will instigate or encourage maybe 20 years from now scientists in developmental biology. In fact, he said, at least he or she can look at what the problems were, where we got stuck, and where there is a possibility of breaking through the crust. And I, I thought about that and said to myself, what appropriate words as we think about inclusiveness and working to expand minority participation, working to ex expand diversity of all types. I spent part of the morning with Grace Yella and Bill, and, and what they did that was most encouraging to me was to ask a lot of questions trying to understand what we have been doing at UMBC and my point of view on things. I, Robbie, the Nobel laureate in physics in the 40s, said that uh, when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' mothers would ask them at the end of a school day, what did you learn in school? He said, but not my Jewish mother. He said, my Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity, he said, made him the thinker he became. Well, it seems to me that as we focus on expanding participation and looking at numbers of women, numbers of people of color, and people from other backgrounds, that a fundamental part of solving the problem of the shortage of people has to do with asking good questions, creating a climate that says to all of us, there is more to know. There's always more to know. And the questions we ask can push us to do more and more. I think it's important, as we think about participation, to focus on the broader context. And I like telling people that we are, right now, looking at about a 60-year experiment in this country when thinking about who we are and how we go about doing things, the, the culture of our country, even. It's only been in this past 60 years that we have said openly that we wanted people of all types 
to participate in mainstream America. When I was a child in Birmingham, there's no way I could have imagined st standing here talking to this group. There's no way I could have imagined being president of UMBC, a place that has students from 100 countries. It was not possible. And yet, uh, as you know, when you think about the, the 1954 decision, when you think about what we did during the Civil Rights Movement, and my, my new book is on that, how the experience for me going to jail with Dr. King and, and then beginning to talk about what it meant to be a child of color in America after that. That coupled with a lot of NSF programs in mathematics um, led me to think about what we might do to increase the numbers of particularly underrepresented minorities, blacks, Hispanics, and others who could succeed in science. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in the room love to read? You've heard part of this before. Uh huh. Um, how many of you love mathematics? <laughs> well, you know, you're not as nerdy as I thought you were. <laughs> you see, on my campus, math rocks. We are connected to NSA. Everybody loves. I get goosebumps all my life. I tell students this, whether they're 8 or 25. I've always gotten goosebumps doing math. In fact, when the teacher would give us 10 problems, I'd say, give us 10 more, teacher. And the whole class would go, shut up, Freeman. I got kicked for math all my life. I've got scars on my legs, right? There's a reason I ask you that. It, it is that we have been taught to think, typically, you're in one thing or another. But even you who are loving science don't necessarily love math. And so when I'm talking to national, uh, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, when I'm talking to chairs of math departments from a community college to Princeton, I am suggesting that we've got a lot of work to do. And one of the points I made at the regional conference is this. When I chaired the National Academies Committee on expanding participation, broadening participation in STEM, we were surprised, and there were people on there, faculty from Harvard and MIT to, to Miami-Dade Community College to the University of Texas, El Paso, a wide, wide range of people. Uh, um, we were surprised at the data. It did not surprise us that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in STEM actually graduate with a major in STEM. Uh, we know some of the challenges. But we were stunned by the numbers for whites and Asians. And so let me ask you a question. What percent of whites in this country who begin with a major in one of the science, technology, engineering, math fields, uh, what percent do you think actually graduate with a bachelor's in those areas? What would you say? If I tell you 20% of the underrepresented minorities do, what percent of whites? I heard 50. I heard 30. 60. It's actually only about 32%. Now, what about for Asians? What do you think it is? I normally get a 90. Yes, I do. Uh huh. Yes, I do. No need to be shamed. I, I get that. Uh huh. <laughs> My campus has about 25% kids of Asian descent, many of whom are the sons and daughters of people who came to grad school who are now working at NIH and other places. Uh, but but uh, it's actually only 41%. Now, the first response from the group was, well, it's a K-12 problem. Because, you see, we tend to think you know, it's somebody else's problem. And so colleges blame high schools who blame elementary schools who blame the families and the husband blames the wife's side of the family. We all blame somebody, all right? Now, it is true that we need to continue to strengthen K through 12. It's great that we all are looking at ways of working with teachers and, and helping people understand what we have to do before people get to college. But what was particularly counterintuitive uh, that, that shocked us was actually stunning was this. The better prepared the students, the higher the AP exams and in chemistry and math, or the higher the, the test scores in general, um, the more prestigious the university the person attends, the greater the probability the student will leave science within the first year or two. Let me say that again, because it doesn't sound like what should be the case. The higher the test scores and the more prestigious the institution, the greater the probability the, the student. And then the first thing people wanted to say was, well, they want to go make money. Or they found something else. But we looked at the data. And the fact is that what happens is that often the student earns up getting a C or below in a first year course. It's usually a quantitative debate, a chemistry course, physics, whatever. And they are accustomed to getting A's. 
And, and we know that, no offense to any of us in the room, and I put myself in this category, we know that the humanities folks and social sciences folks are con considered usually a little, more, a little warmer than we are in STEM. No offense to any of you. I know you're all wonderful people, all right? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Uh, but what I'm saying to you also, though, is that because of grades, they leave, okay? And um, I said this to all of the directors of NIH. And I said it to them for this reason. When I'm over at NIH, when I'm at NSF, when I'm talking to colleagues, everyone will say, when Congress gets ready to cut the budget, why aren't people fighting for science? And our first response is, well, because people don't know any science and people who are not educated, right, will not be forced. But, but think about it. If even high achieving people in this country are most likely not to succeed in the work, and I'm not talking about going on for PhDs, but to leave it within the first year or two because of not doing well, if we know that we call the first year of science weed out courses, why would we expect the American public to relate to science in such a way that they would be working with Congress people and others to fight to keep science. If they don't fully understand the connection between what we do and life itself and our lives, and especially if they had a painful experience. How many of you did well in science in college? You all did. And this, that's, and that's not an indictment, that's a compliment. All right? <laughs> but I'm telling you that because I'm asking you to get beyond your comfort level and think about the people who earned that C or D who left. And when I'm talking to groups that are not like yours, I guarantee you when I ask these questions, you see it on people's faces. In fact, I was talking, and one of the prestigious lawyers at NIH said, because I, I tell a joke, I always say, people start off with pre-med and they become great lawyers. It's a joke, but it's true. It really is. It is true. And she said, he just told my story. I went to one of the most prestigious of all, perfect SAT, never made a B in my life, got that first C in chemistry, went home and told, told everybody, I love you, humanities, which I do. She did. She just didn't tell them she bombed out of the chemistry. You get my point? But she never forgot it. She never forgot it. Now, what is my, if you look at my TED talk, you will see me talking about changing the culture of science. And what we have learned at UMBC are the fundamental um, expectations, what makes the difference. The four things we talked about, high expectations, building community to foster collaboration. It takes researchers to produce researchers. And finally, the idea that relationships between faculty and students really do matter. This is one of the reasons that we know liberal arts colleges are tending to know to do better with a lot of students in science than major, uh, major large institutions for undergraduates. And one of the ways you can prove that is look at the large percentage of people in the National Academy of Sciences who had undergrad experiences in liberal arts colleges, from Tom Jack to David Baltimore. You've got a lot of Nobel laureates, and they will say it was that relationship with that faculty member working in a lab, of course, that can make the difference. What is my point? Two things. Number one, before we can talk about somehow increasing substantially the number of minorities, for example, who succeed, we need to look at the overall culture in science to really make a difference. And that is what we had to do at UMBC. The Maha program is, is particularly significant, and I'm, I'm delighted to accept this award, but not because of me, but because of what a lot of people like Michelle and so many of our faculty members, with staff, with faculty, who have taken ownership of the question, what do we need to do to increase substantially the numbers of minorities, and for us heavily black and some Hispanics, who can succeed in these areas? And a major part of it has meant that not only have we had to work with those students, but we worked to change the culture. There is a, uh, a book entitled um, The Geography of Bliss by Eric Weiner, And he says this about culture. He says, culture is the sea we swim in, so pervasive, so all-consuming, that we fail to notice its existence until we step out of it. And I would suggest to you, as we look at what you've been doing, the kinds of work that you've been doing, well, we're talking about what you've done with Choose Development and what you've done with your committee uh, on inclusion and diversity, is to step out and see where are we right now and what is it we need to do. The fact is that when you look back over this 60-year period that I was talking about, there's several things we can say. 
Number one, that we only began to, to get excited about people in general going to college in the 60s. Um, all of you have heard about the GI Bill, right? The Veterans Bill in 1944. What group do you think fought FDR, President Roosevelt, in having that legislation passed? What group said, if you allow those veterans into our institutions, they will become, quote, academic hobo jungles, unquote. Who do you think said that? College presidents of the most prestigious institutions in our country. They did not, it's fully documented, did not want veterans to come in to the institute. Why am I telling you this? It is because even when you have extraordinarily well-educated people who mean well, they, it wasn't that they didn't care about the veterans, but they thought veterans should be regular people. And this is mainly regular white men, quite frankly. I mean, lower caste, working class, uh, middle class guys, that they should be going into the trades. They did not feel that regular Americans should be going to universities. Now, that's just in the 40s that the most educated in our society, because the fact is this, it is difficult to change the culture of a society, of a university, and the people who are most comfortable and most powerful usually are people who will say things are fine as they are. It takes another level of thinking to suggest perhaps there is room for considerable improvement or to change to some extent the group that's involved. Now, so what happened was, uh, in spite of those presidents from Harvard to the University of Chicago fighting it vehemently, the President of the United States was able to get that legislation through. Veterans began to go in within several years. Millions of Americans, heavily men but some women, heavily white but some minorities, went to college with great discipline and did well. And for the first time, Americans began to believe maybe regular, people who are not wealthy people, can go to college. And so when the 1965 Act came along after the Civil Rights Act, the fact is, quite frankly, that we had a very different world. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room are either first generation college or first, first in your family or first generation college? Let me see your hands. And it's probably 40% of this room. In most groups, it's going to be even more because, you see, the fact is that in 1965, people didn't expect their children to go to college. This type, I'm not getting to science yet. I'm just talking about college. Just 50 years ago, get out of our seat, get out of the culture to understand what we're talking about here. And so what percent of Americans do you think had a college degree in 1965? What percent? And we gave them until they were 25 and 25. What do you think? What, what did I hear? I heard 20, I heard 5. It, don't, it was 10%. Now, at that time, we divided everything into black and white, okay? We hadn't started looking at other ethnic groups. Everything was black and white. I can prove it. How many of you have ever seen black and white TV? <laughs> oh, you're a little older than I thought you were. Oh, <laughs> you just look good. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but, but everything was so safe. We just had the statistics. They talked that way. But what percent of whites had a college degree? If 10% of all Americans had a college degree, what percent of whites? Now, you know, you know, if the average is 10, you know whites are the most privileged. Now, come on, math. <laughs> you know, it's got to be more than the average, right? It's actually only 11%. And for blacks, don't be embarrassed. What do you think for blacks? It's 2%, between 2 and 3%. And almost all were in the HBCUs, a few, just a very few before that. And that's in 1965, okay? What percent of Americans today have a college degree? I heard 20, anybody else? It is about 31, 32%. Okay, and it's really important that professors know this because it puts in context where we are as a society as we talk about producing more scientists. And so here's the point. When you break it down, we're up to 37% of whites. We're up to, the fastest growing group in our country is what group? Hispanics, right, Latinos, and they are up to about 15%. Blacks are at about 22, 23%. Asian Americans, it's at about 55%. You put it together, though, literally two-thirds of Americans today of all races across the board are from families where no one has gone to college. Now, usually when I say that, my friends of every race was a Freeman. That could not be true because everybody I know has a college degree. <laughs> Duh! <laughs> 
we're all around people like professors are around professors, you know, doctors are around me, physicians are around physicians, plumbers who make more money than most of us are around plumbers, and so it just depends. It really does depend on who you're around. But the key to that is this, in terms of our democracy. The fact is that if you're from the bottom quarter of Americans, economically, of any race, the probability in the 60s of your getting a college degree was about 10%, and today it's the same thing. So as we think about diversity, we have to think about women in special areas like technology, because we've got a 50% decline in women in computer science since the 80s, for example. We have to think about people of color from underrepresented groups. But we also have to think about, and all kinds of diversity, from LGBTQ all the way over to talking about people with income at the income level, because there are reasons for that. Now, let me show you one thing that will really surprise you. How many of you in this room are over 45 years old? You look really good. You really do. <laughs> So you're in the best two or three, um, if you're in America and you're in the best two or three, in, I mean, literally the best educated in the world. If you're over 55, believe it or not, you're number one, but over 45, you're number two or three, depending on how they count for percentage with bachelor's degrees. Is anyone in the room between 25 and 34? Oh, they're so proud. Look at them. Look at them. They're just so proud. I've got good news and bad. Which one you want first? Bad news, you're not as smart as we are. I'm sorry. I hate to tell you. I love saying it anyway. <laughs> I'm really just kidding, kind of, kind of. But the fact is, you all are number 13 in the world. Why? Because we've got more people than ever going to college, but guess what? They do not graduate. Over half of the people who start college don't graduate. Now, you want your good news, though, right? The good news is we are jealous as hell because we wish we were your ages. All right, so feel good about being your ages. But it is a challenge, so that's the context. The context is that, quite frankly, 50 million Americans who started two and four-year colleges never did graduate. So the big issue for America, when thinking about most of its institutions, except the most privileged, the wonderful liberal arts colleges, and most privileged, and, and those where you've got people from families of means, is that in most cases, the, the graduation rates are well below 45%. Now, you take that and add to it the fact that, as I said, the majority of students, two-thirds of those who start in science, leave it, primarily because they didn't have a good experience. What we work to do on my campus that I want to, to give you as an example is the Mahoff program really did allow us to look at those that we considered the least well-prepared. And what we said was, let's find the best prepared black kids we can find. We started with blacks, then we went to Hispanics and other groups, but in, in, in there in Baltimore and in the Maryland region. And interestingly enough, we used something from W.E.B. Du Bois that said, you find the talented 10th and you, you work to make them much better than they ever thought they could be. Because when we think of minorities, we think of either remediation or we think of sports. And the idea of working to help them to be far better than they thought they could be, but to have faculty who were willing to try the experiment. Because when I looked around the country, I could not find one predominantly white university that could tell me that even five students were graduating in the life sciences and going on to get PhDs. Not one. Uh, there are, and today, when you look at the issues in science and technology piece, you will see that we've made some progress. We became the first predominantly white university, sending a pretty good number, meaning 10 to 15, quite frankly, in the life sciences, similar numbers in physical sciences, similar numbers in engineering on, who were completing PhDs. And so people wanted to know the other places were Howard and the other minority institutions. Just like with, for the Hispanics, the number one producer of Hispanics who go on to get PhDs in the sciences, the report that we did, will say the University of Puerto Rico, certain campuses, starting with Maragres. In fact, Maragres' number will be over a five-year period 150. In comparison, the first mainland place is Berkeley, which has one-third that number for all, all groups of Hispanics. Did you get that? So from 150 to 50. So what am I saying? No one in the country is doing a really good job of producing large numbers of students of color from these underrepresented groups who will go on and get PhDs. Even the top group, you're talking 5, 10, 15 at most. Now, it is encouraging that what this new issue of issues in science and technology tells us is that University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, my grad alma mater, and University of Florida have gotten into that list of top 10. 
Those are two examples. The other good news is that the Howard Hughes people uh, uh, have now funded a major program that focuses on replicating Meyerhoff both at Chapel Hill and at the University of North Carolina. And we're very pleased about that. And what makes the difference will be not only mentoring, but ch being a champion. I will just one example, the former dean of, um, of uh, medical school at Duke, uh, you'll appreciate that, Sandy. Williams was wonderful and called me down years ago to talk to department chairs about what can we do to have more of the medical students thinking about becoming faculty members. And because of his work, we've got a lot of students who go there. We have, by the way, UMBC is the number one producer of MD, PhDs in the country. Give us a black MD, PhDs in the country. Give us a big round of applause for that. I'm very proud of that. And the key is that right now, I can tell you we have four black males on the Duke medical faculty in tenure track positions and around the country. And so this is what I leave you with. I go back to what Hamburger said, that if I'm lucky, at least as time goes on, scientists more and more will look at the problems and where we've been stuck and the possibility of breaking through the crust. I challenge you, SDP, SDB, to think carefully about how to identify people, not just to participate in these programs, but to follow them all the way through to tenure in faculty positions. Because it's only when we have many more people tenured of color will we begin to be able to change the complexion of any of our disciplines. Thank you all very much. <laughs>